Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Kristen, for that introduction. And thank all of you for coming out today. This cold weather, we have lots of good art to keep you warm, I hope, here in the auditorium and, of course, in the absolutely splendid Sargent exhibition that's just across the way. And I wanted to congratulate my colleagues and friends at the MFA on this wonderful show, um, especially Erica Herschler, curator of the show and a dear friend. I am very honored to have my work included in the exhibition catalog with a group of such really distinguished and fine scholars. I'm happy to say that I have, um, I have brought my own fan club today. I have some family members and friends who've made the trip and I'm so grateful. I feel incredibly fortunate to have this icon who you see on the screen as part of my life and my daily life at the Met. And through her, I have met some really wonderful and extraordinary people. As Kristen mentioned, I'm working on a show about Sargent in Paris, and I loved what I interpreted as those appreciative um, noises from the audience. We're really, really looking forward to the show at the Met in 2025, and to bring Sargent's works back to Paris, his early works back to Paris, I think will be a big thrill. I wanted to acknowledge one person who's not here today, who's been an, an extraordinary help to me on this project, um, we have wonderful colleagues at the Met in the Orsay, but I have a fabulous research assistant, Caroline Elenowitz Hess, who has been deep into Sargent archives and 19th century French periodicals and has really made a lot of this research and some of the fun things that we're going to see today possible. So in our time together today, there she is. Um, we're going to take a close look at Sargent's alluring portrait of the American socialite, Virginie Avenio, oh, sorry, Virginie Amélie Avenio Gautreau, known to us today as Madame X. The portrait has a legendary and well-known history, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the key details. Sargent's provocative portrait of the society celebrity caused an uproar when it was first exhibited at the Paris Salon in 1884 affecting the reputations of both the artist and the subject. Looking back at the portrait some 30 years later in 1915 though, Sargent would declare it the best thing I've ever done. His rendering of her scandalous character and self-fashioning continues to captivate the millions of visitors who come to gaze at her mysterious beauty each year at the Met in New York and now in Boston and soon in London. 140 years after um, its debut in Paris, it has become a familiar and enduring icon, symbolizing glamour and elegance, the quintessentially chic Parisienne, female empowerment, celebrity, and second chances. Among other things, she has become a stylish muse. From Dina Merrill to Nicole Kidman to Hari Neff, socialites, actresses, and models have channeled Gautreaux's distinctive, self, uh, distinctive pose and plunging neckline both reinforcing and challenging ideas of timeless beauty. And these are just a very small sampling of fashion photography shoots inspired by Sargent's portrait. And these span, as you can see, 60 years from 1960 to 2017, and we find new ones every day. The degree to which the portrait has infiltrated popular culture and consciousness is evident. Here is just one of the many Madame X tattoos that I've seen over the years. This is a former colleague from the Met, and I'm gonna interrupt myself to say, if you're so inspired after the talk and the show to have Sargent tattooed on your body, please send me a photo. I am an ever-growing collection of these images, and um, they're quite fun. In this New Yorker cover from May 2001, you see Madame X here on the steps of the Met, uh, the embodiment of the Met's collection, standing between figures by here she is, Rubens, Goya, and Gauguin. She's a sort of ambassador to the Met, welcoming visitors. Although she may uh, just be waiting for an ice cream bar here, but yeah, you know, I'm sure she gets hungry too. Um, and then, oops, I'm so sorry. Her story and the story of the portrait has also inspired a ballet um, that was inspired by Deborah Davis's popular book, Strapless choreographed by the great Christ Christopher Wheeldon for the Royal Ballet in London. I haven't seen the ballet, but it seems to have inspired a pas de deux with Dr. Pozzi, the 
charming, handsome surgeon gynecologist who you can, you know, famous for his very red coat and who you can see in the current exhibition. But we will talk more about that later. Sometimes I feel that Madame X is everywhere, or perhaps the internet algorithm really gets me. Both are possible. I woke up yesterday morning to these two things. On the left, you see the actress Michelle Williams in a Scaparelli gown a la Madame X with her porcelain skin and her plunging neckline. And on the right, this wonderful article from Forbes, um, which in fact makes a great lead into my talk today. The headline, as you see, Madame X makes rare trip from the Met to MFA Boston as part of Fashion by Sargent. Wall power. What the art world calls a painting jumping off the wall, demanding to be recognized. The visual equivalent of Whitney Houston's voice. No picture ever painted has more of it than John Singer Sargent's portrait of Madame X. Not the Mona Lisa, not Starry Night, not the Birth of Venus. Madame X exudes with a total lack of subtlety the power and confidence manifested by a beautiful woman who knows she is beautiful, and what's more, knows what effect that beauty has on people, men and women. I mean, what more do I have to say? We could just, we'll stop the lecture right now. Um, but we're gonna talk a lot more about that and the wall power in a little bit. In his best portraits, Sargent challenged traditional ideas about the genre provoking viewers with unconventional choices of subjects and style. Many of his greatest works, including, or perhaps especially Madame X, so familiar to us today, were seen as progressive, shocking, or deemed eccentric in that era. Like Sargent's many portraits, many, many of Sargent's portraits, Madame X transcends individual likeness to embody the dramatically changing society in which she was painted. He immortalized the glamorous Parisian woman of his era in a timeless image that continues to resonate with ideas about identity, self-fashioning, and celebrity. So in our time together today, we'll take a deep dive into the creation and the history of this remarkable portrait. But we will start at the beginning with our artist. Here is Sargent, seen here in a photograph from about 1874, the year that he arrived in Paris as an 18-year-old aspiring artist. Of course, you will remember, Sargent had been born in Italy to American parents and spent his whole life thus far traveling seasonally throughout Europe, where he was exposed to the sights and great art of the continent and encouraged to sketch by his mother, who was an amateur artist. His peripatetic family had decided that Paris, then the center of the art world, was the best place to cultivate his emerging talent. Sargent arrived in Paris very well prepared to further his artistic training and launch his career. And on the screen here, I'm showing you examples of his very earliest works, um, things he had all accomplished before he arrived in Paris at 18. And I love to show these, um, these watercolors are from, were done when he was 13 years old. So to underscore the idea that he had been training and cultivating his hand and his eye and his talent since he was a very young child. In the center, and you see him painting, of course, he's doing portraiture, he's doing landscape, um, you know, kind of covering his bases. At the center is another early copy by Sargent after Michelangelo, of course, the figure of Knight in the Medici Chapel in Florence. He was raised in a tradition that valued and honored the art of the past and the art of the present, and he cultivated an eclectic taste and, and studied all of these works. And on the far right, you see the kind of sketch that he had made an academic exercise that he would have done in Florence in the early 1870s when he was a student at the Academy of the, the Academia in Florence studying art before arriving in Paris. So when we talk about him arriving as a student, we can kind of see that he is already very, very well prepared. I would note that he arrives in Paris in May of 1874, May, I think, 16th to be precise. And May is an important month in Paris for the art world, and especially in 1874, of course, the great annual art exhibition known as the, Palace, the Paris Salon had opened at the very beginning of May. And we'll talk a lot more about this today. This is the huge government-sponsored 
art exhibition. And when I say huge, um, there would be upwards of 2,000 paintings on display by all kinds of artists, all kinds of subjects, all kinds of genres. And this was um, the kind of classical tradition in a world that of course was changing, Paris in the 1870s, but this was kind of the um, main venue for artists to exhibit, display their art, find potential patrons and possibly commissions. And so we know that Sargent shortly after he arrived attended this exhibition and kind of surveyed the Paris art scene. The other thing that of course happened in May of 1874 was the first exhibition of the group that we now call the Impressionists. Unfortunately for Sargent, that show closed on May 15th and he arrived on the 16th, but this is really signaling a sea change in Paris, that this group of independent artists, you see two works here by Monet of course, um, were beginning to find other venues to display their art outside of the academy and outside of these kind of sh sanctioned government exhibitions. And I show you these two works by Monet because by 1876, Sargent had befriended Monet and would form a very lasting friendship. So though Sargent takes kind of the most, a more conservative and traditional route by enrolling in the French Academy, the government-sponsored school, he is also very well connected to the more progressive parts of the Paris art world. And I hope that's something that we take away from thinking about Sargent's time in Paris, that he is really straddling, straddling and maneuvering between all these worlds. The line is not so severe as we sometimes think, the Impressionists on one side and the academics on the other. Sargent enrolls in the teaching studio of a portraitist called Carolus Duran. And um, we know, he tells a friend in a letter, Sargent writes that he had seen his works at the Salon that year, he had exhibited portraits, and admired them very much. He tells his friend that Carolus is considered one of the greatest French artists. And Sargent described his teacher as, quote, a young and rising artist whose reputation is continuously increasing. He is chiefly a portrait painter and has a very broad, powerful, and realistic style. He had a, also had a reputation as a very kind and generous teacher who ran a congenial studio environment. Um, you see, obviously, a photo of him on the left, very dapper, uh, elegant, bohemian artist. And on the right, probably his best-known work, a portrait of his wife, known as the Lady with the Glove, that um, was shown at the Paris Salon of 1869 to great acclaim. And not only does Carolus serve as a teacher, but he does become a kind of artistic role model for Sargent, understanding portraiture, get, gaining commissions, a portraiture that's flattering, and, and how to kind of maneuver through the Paris art world. Um, Carolus also encouraged his students to cultivate a fluid painting style and preserve the immediacy of the sketch in their finished works. And Sargent flourished in his studio, embracing these methods and quickly becoming the star pupil. Carolus also encouraged all of his students to study the old masters, something that Sargent always was interested in doing, but particularly exhorted the great painterly artists Velasquez, the, the 17th century Spanish master, or who's, this is Sargent's copy of Las Meninas on the left, and on the right, a copy by Sargent after the great artist Franz Hals. Um, so this is the kind of material that Sargent is absorbing, the kind of teaching lessons of painting and studying the great art or, around him. Sargent makes his debut exhibiting his first painting at the Salon in 1877, a portrait of a family friend, a young woman. But I want to move to 1879, the year that he exhibited his portrait of his teacher, Carolus. A remarkable image, a certainly an homage to his master, but I think also a kind of gauntlet, um, announcing his, the end of his studies, at, you know, his end, sorry, the end of his time in the atelier, but also kind of letting it be known that he was now competing for commissions in the French capital with his teacher. And this painting has um, a lovely inscription on the top, to my dear teacher, Monsieur Carolus Duran, um, from your affectionate student, John Singer Sargent, John S. Sargent, with a signature. 
So it's an endearing, a fond inscription, but also in a spot that anyone who would have seen this at the salon would, the connection between Sargent and his master would be very clear. And as I said, he quickly surpassed him. Carolus, who had sort of peaked in the 1860s and early 70s, um, was becoming more known as a teacher, though he continued to make portraits as Sargent's star was rising. So that same year that he showed Carolus at the Salon, Sargent also showed this painting, a Capriote of 1878, the year earlier. And this is a painting from the M MFA's collection, which is on display, I'm sure, right now in their permanent collection galleries. So I hope you'll all take a look. But I wanted to make the point here that as Sargent is advertising his skills at this large exhibition, he is, again, covering his bases, exhibiting portraits, hoping for commissions, but also showing his ability as a painter of genre scenes or scenes of everyday life. And in this case, a scene done during a trip to Capri, where he's kind of tapping into this sense of the beauty of nature, exoticism, um, the woman in nature. And these, this duality, this kind of very strategic way of exhibiting and marketing his portraits is something that he will continue throughout his life. This painting um, from the Metz collection, known as Lady with the Rose, is a portrait of Charlotte's, uh, sorry, of Sargent's friend Charlotte Louise Burkhart. And this is a painting that really also helped establish Sargent in the capital as a portraitist who flattered his subjects in, a, in an idealized way. And this painting was um, widely celebrated when it was first exhibited um, as an ideal representation of a young woman. As I said, unapologetically flattering, this gesture where she proffers a rose, offers a hint of a narrative that was appealing to contemporary viewers. And it's around this time that Sargent first meets the great American writer, novelist, Henry James. Of course, they had a lot in common. Both were expatriates and great recorders of the transatlantic social scene in these eras. James was, from early on, a very astute and supportive critic of Sargent's work throughout his life. And a few years later, when Sargent was preparing to come to the US for the first time, he wrote about this portrait, saying, it overflows with perfection and famously observed that the portrait offered, quote, the slightly uncanny spectacle of a talent which on the very threshold of its career has nothing more to learn. James noted that Sargent's brilliance was not precocious. He attributed it to the freshness of youth combined with the artistic experience really felt and assimilated of generations. Critics noticed immediately its relationship to works by the old masters. Here's an example of a painting by Velasquez, of course, whom we know Sargent admired greatly. This kind of monochromatic background, the pose, the gesture, these are all um, echoes of the Spanish old masters. We don't know for sure that Sargent knew this painting by Velasquez, but I do think the correspondences are quite remarkable. At the same time, thinking about Sargent and fashion, um, Here's an example of a dress from the Metz collection, an, e oops, I lost my caption. Um, an evening dress from this period, the early 1880s. Um, and you can see that the dress that Charlotte Burkhardt is wearing in the portrait really does, it's very similar in many ways. But the way that Sargent poses her, enhances it, um, narrows the waist, really also evokes, I think, the Spanish Baroque. And critics notice that. Um, one of them wrote that um, the dress that Burkhart wore, quote, um, had been worn, probably worn by some demure princess who might have sat for Velasquez. And I note this, these correspondences, again, to point out Sargent's way of kind of combining the art of the past with the present moment and something that he became quite, quite adept at. And this very flattering portrait of Miss Burkhart is the kind of work that earned him more, more, many more commissions and some um, acknowledgement on the stage. But of course, Sargent also painted unconventional portraits during this period. And this, of course, is the great Dr. Samuel Pozzi, um, again, in the exhibition. And it's 
purely coincidental that I wore red today because <laughs> it's not like this is one of my favorite portraits. Um, this is such a remarkable and amazing portrait. Pozzi was such a fascinating figure, a pioneer of modern gynecology in France, who is recognized for his role in advancing the reproductive safety of women. And treatises that he wrote in his day apparently are still referred to in um, libraries. One grateful patient, the famous actor Sarah Bernhardt, famously called Pozzi Dr. God, which speaks to his surgical prowess, but also perhaps to his divine good looks. He was also an aesthete and an art collector who moved in progressive artistic circles. And perhaps Sargent had met him through his teacher, Carolus Duran, we don't know quite exactly. Sargent was fascinated with Pozzi and described him in, as a letter, in a letter to a friend as a, quote, very brilliant creature. And I think Sargent's admiration for and attraction to this charismatic doctor is evident in the portrait, which is quite bold. Of course, this unbelievably daring red portrait, the red dressing gown against the velvet red curtain. The original title, when first displayed, made it very clear that Dr. Pozzi was at home, at his house, and this kind of intimate view of a very public figure really shows Sargent pushing the boundaries in portraiture and what was um, acceptable. Um, of course, there's this very elegant pose, the manner gestured, gestures the way that Sargent paints those wonderful white cuffs to accentuate Pozzi's hands and his face and playing with the tassel of his robe. There's something so sensual and seductive about this portrait and then and its blood red palette cannot let us forget that he is a surgeon. And I just want to mention, I mean, that's it, the way that it exudes this powerful, powerful self-confidence. All of this, of course, for many visitors and viewers of the painting, evoked images by the old masters. I'm thinking particularly of Velazquez or Van Dyck, these painterly painters who Sargent greatly admired. I will never forget how um, the great writer Jean Strauss, writing about Sargent in 2015, described Dr. Dr. Pozzi as, quote, a sexy pope. I mean, what, what more do we need to say? <laughs> um, Sargent's portrait of Madame Ramon Subercazo, also on view in the exhibition downstairs. Um, again, we're kind of switching back and forth between these progressive portraits and then these more um, genuinely beautiful, flattering, fashionable portraits. Um, Subercazo, of course, was from Chile. She was the wife of a Chilean diplomat who was also an artist and became good friends with Sargent. He painted her in their home in France, this very elegant, contemporary aesthetic interior. Again, a hint of narrative as she sits at her piano in this wonderful black and white dress, which Sargent really paints with this fluid technique. We get the sense of that fluing, fluid skirt. And Sargent's really showing her as the ultimate kind of chic Parisienne, the woman of Paris. And I note that in particular because, of course, she wasn't from Paris. She was from Chile. And this idea of women from elsewhere assimilating this lifestyle, this kind of glamour, is something that's extremely relevant to our discussion of Madame Gautreaux. So the portrait of Madame Supercazo was shown at the Salon with this portrait of the Pyrone children, um, an incredible portrait. Um, the Pyrone, Sargent had painted both of the Pyrone parents, and you can see their portrait of their father in the exhibition across the way. Um, but again, I'm, I'm, I hope I'm not kind of beating a dead horse, but the contrast between the kind of beautiful um, aesthetic portrait of Madame Subercazo and looking closely at this portrait of the brother and sister where we see a certain intensity which I think is unusual for the period of, for portraits of children. Um, we know that Marie Louise who wrote an autobiography later um, had a very fierce personality and she and Sargent were at odds over all parts of this portrait, what she would wear, how she would sit. Um, she says it has to be apocryphal, maybe not, that there were something like 74 sittings because she was so uncooperative. And I think when you look closely at Marie Louise, you sense her indomitable personality, um, the tension in her hands, the intensity of the gaze. And if we compare it for a moment to a portrait of 
uh, by Carolus Duran of the artist's daughter from close to the same period, um, how conventional, kind of Victorian sweet the portrait by Carolus is in contrast to this psychological intensity of Marie Louise. Um, the two portraits, I'll just go back for a minute, when they were shown at the Paris Salon, in 1882, won Sargent an important award. And what this award meant for him is that he no longer had to submit his paintings to the Salon jury. It was or concours. So he, all of the pre previous submissions, most everyone who sent paintings there had to be judged by this, this large jury. Now that he had passed this kind of gauntlet, he could now submit whatever he want, ostensibly. Um, which leads the way to, of course, this amazing, amazing, iconic work, The Daughters of Edward Darley Boyd. My slide is not doing justice to the portrait, as you all know, but of course you're just gonna go upstairs and gaze on it after the talk, because it's such an endlessly um, fascinating and incredible portrait with a, a, a similar kind, a similar but different kind of psychological intensity that we see in the, boy, the um, Pyron children. Sargent has created this kind of mysterious, evocative interior. These are the four daughters of his friend, Edward Boyd, a Bostonian who was also a painter um, in their Paris home. And there's this, this sense of mystery, of ambiguity. It kind of goes between portraiture and a genre scene. And the, the sense of space, and the depth of the space, the mysterious quality of the interior. And then, of course, this kind of disquieting sense of scale. You've all seen the portrait up in the gallery, so you know those were those, they had those big vases. They always lived with them and traveled with them. But this kind of playing with the scale, um, I think, adds intensity and emotion to the portrait. Um, it feels a little sacrilege to be talking about this painting um, with Erica Herschler in the audience. So um, she, of course, is the expert, and you all must read her great book, A Sergeant's Daughters, about this portrait. Um, and I, I wanted to note again, of course, about this again, that same theme of the kind of the, the modernity of the portrait, the unusual qualities with the homage to the old masters. And of course, I'm thinking of Velazquez's Las Meninas, which Sargent, as you all know, had copied. All right, so the stakes were increasingly high for Sargent after his kind of, the, the growing success he had at the Salon. So how do you follow the Boyd daughters? Um, well, you follow the Boyd daughters at the Paris Salon with Madame X. We don't know exactly how or when Sargent and Gautreaux first met, but Sargent became fascinated with Gautreaux in the early 1880s. She was, of course, born in Louisiana in New Orleans. Her family was French Creole. Her father died at the Battle of Shiloh during the Civil War, and Gautreaux's uh, at that point, Avenio's mother picked up her family, her daughter and herself, and moved to Paris where they had some relatives. Now, we talk about her as an American. She was born in the US. She considered herself American, but she moved to France, to Paris, when she was eight years old. So she learned French, she went to French schools, but again, there's this, this her history is always American, which would remain important for those who saw her around Paris and when they looked at the portrait later. She, at age 19, she married Pierre Gautreaux, who was a French businessman from an established family. Um, we've often generally called him a banker, but really he was involved in the shipping business. He was an importer. Um, one periodical described him in the time as an importer of colonial goods. One of the goods he was known to import was bat guano, which of course was used as fertilizer. And I don't even, I'm not even showing you a picture of him today. We do have some photos of him. Um, but in the period, many, many writers and critics just remarked, well, you know, who would want to be Pierre Gautreaux? No one pays attention to him. It's always about his wife. So I apologize to him, but I'm continuing that tradition today. Um, but importantly, 
you know, Gautreaux's, uh, sorry, Amel Virginie went by the name Amélie. So Amélie's family had some resources, but Pierre Gautreaux's family was quite successful. And really, it's this marriage that allows her to be launched into Parisian society. So from 1878 to the time the portrait is painted in 1884, I think there's a remarkable transformation. And so I've been waiting to show you this. There she is at her wedding in 1874. And it's a bit of an unfair comparison, of course, because as I said, once she gets married and has access to finances, she begins to really cultivate her image, her self-fashioning in Paris, um, wearing couture gowns, contriving elaborate cosmetic schemes, and really creating an image uh, that she sticks through really for the next decade. But I think that this, we think of this kind of transformation from this sort of young, innocent bride with her bangs to the kind of glamazon that we see on the left um, is, is kind of fascinating and somewhat shocking. Um, so as she was kind of more and more out in society, um, she was admired for her arresting beauty, her beautiful profile, her gorgeous lines, and she highlighted her good looks with an array of striking couture gowns and this, as I said, elaborate cosmetic regimen. Newspapers raved about her appearance and often reported her among the, quote, pretty women wearing delightful dresses who were seen at receptions around the French capital. Amélie, as she was known, artfully exploited her appearance to increase her social status in Paris. And her fashion sense and self-fashioning were essential to this ascendancy. In 1880, a writer for the New York Herald recognized her as a work of art come to life. Madame Gautreaux is a statue of Canova transmitted into flesh and blood and bone and muscle, dressed by Felix, who was a famous couturier of the day, and coiffed by his assistant, Emile. All her contours are harmonious. I know she is the loveliest creature I ever beheld coming of the hands, off the hands of a Parisian dressmaker. So this idea that she was kind of performing and acting a role became a work of art through the assistance of a couturiers and a hairdresser. This living statue, as another writer labeled her, was invented by these um, French designers. Sargent was captivated by Gautreaux's self-fashioning and contrived to paint her portrait. And he wrote to his cousin, Ben del Castillo, Castillo, saying, quote, I have a great desire to paint her portrait and have reason to think she would allow it and is just waiting for someone to promote, propose this homage to her beauty. Sargent pursued her with determination and in 1882 convinced her to pose without a commission for a life-size portrait, which was destined, of course, for the most prestigious and public of venues, the Salon of 1884. In some ways, their meeting seems predestined. Even before they met, they had been linked in the press in an article from 1881. A critic identified Sargent and Gautreau as exemplars of what he saw as a troubling trend. Americans infiltrating Parisian society and usurping attention from their French counterparts. The writer chafed at this potential for social mobility, noting that Americans, quote, have painters who take away our medals, like Mr. Sargent, and pretty women who eclipse ours, like Madame Gautreaux. A few years later, the portrait formalized this alliance. Conceived with great ambition, the portrait was a calculated collaboration between the rising painter and the increasingly well-known aspiring bourgeois sitter, two young Americans seeking celebrity in the French capital. In his enigmatic subject, Sargent saw an artistic challenge. He described his fascination with Gautreaux in a letter to his friend Vernon Lee, writing, do you object to people who are farde, which means made up or painted, to the extent of being a uniform lavender or a blotting paper color all over? If so, you would not care for my sitter, but she has the most beautiful lines, and if the lavender, or chlorate of potash lozenge color be pretty in itself, I shall be more than pleased. 
So yes, he's describing her skin tone as lavender, but also comparing her to a, lo a lozenge, like a chalky lozenge. Um, and Lee recalled, writing some years later, Sargent was engrossed in perpetually and perpetually dissatisfied attempts to render adequately the strange, weird, fantastic, curious beauty of that peacock woman, Madame Gautreaux. As a young man, he was, and perhaps remained, especially attracted by the bizarre and outlandish. Such were his individual predilections. So Sargent obsessed over her lines and made more studies in preparation for this portrait than he did for any other portrait he, in, he ever made in his career. And I'm going to show you a bunch of them here. Um, and you see from kind of formal to more informal, he is looking at her poised on the sofa, lounging, the remarkable watercolor where she seems to be looking at a folio on her lap, and this very, very casual sketch where she's whispering to a friend. This fabulous and very small oil study of her drinking a toast is in the collection of the Gardner Museum right across the way, and this wonderful drawing, dramatically lit, um, seemingly related to it. And what you begin to notice, of course, is that almost all of the drawings that he does show her in profile, as I said, preoccupied with her beautiful lines. Um, and there is this, this, at one point, um, of course, he goes out to the Gautreau summer home in Brittany where he w works to continue the portrait. And he writes a letter to a friend complaining that he is struggling with the unpaintable beauty and hopeless laziness of Madame Gautreau. I want to say that this is a lot of studies too, right? I think because he was so fascinated with her and kind of struggling to capture her complexity, maybe he was also asking a lot of from her, um, you know, and she was, again, this is not a commission. So she's in a way doing him a favor, but of course she had a lot to gain from the success of the portrait as well. So interestingly, um, as I said, I mean, the way he's laboring over this portrait, he continues to kind of edit it as the salon gets closer. And so of course you're seeing the finished version on the left. And we know um, when we look, you can look closely at the painting in the galleries. And if you look around her profile, look at her shoulders, you can see that Sargent had edited the painting and made changes to this form. We also know that he, very close to it being done, he completely changed the color of the background. So continuing to kind of fuss with it and perfect it. At some point, he started a second version of the painting. And, and sometimes this one on the right from the Tate collection has been called a study for the portrait. But we really know now that it's an unfinished replica, replica that Sargent was creating another version of the painting which he had not finished. And it wasn't uncommon for him in this period to make more than one version of a painting um, that he would sometimes show in one in the US, one in France, as a way to cultivate his career. I'm sure he also hoped that the Gautreaux would buy the portrait, which if they didn't, um, and then he would have one for himself. But regardless, the second version um, remains unfinished. Uh, let's see. Um, so I wanted to know a word about her dress. Um, Sargent would have certainly discussed dress options with Gautreaux. One critic noted before the painting made its debut at the Salon that the woman in question was to be represented in le costume that she was particularly fond of. And her black dress with its plunging decolletage and bared arms and shoulders afforded Sargent ample opportunity to paint her artificially pale skin and her form. Um, and Sargent poses her in a way also to accentuate all of these qualities. And I think the pose is also quite unusual if we think of um, other portraits. The pose is kind of contorted and difficult. She turns away from the viewer, not gazing at us. And I always, when I'm talking to people about this painting in front of the portrait, I think, you know, try to make this pose. It's one of great tension and torque. And up close, you can see the veins in her neck, the veins in her arms. So maybe that's another reason that he, she felt hopelessly lazy to Sargent because he was asking her for this unusual pose, which is an important part of the finished portrait and the way that it was interpreted. 
Um, of course, the dress in the period would have probably had a bustle, which Sargent takes great pains to obscure. That would have also messed with her beautiful lines and her profile of her body. And the way that her profile is, of her face is so deliberately severe while her body turns towards the picture plane. Um, we know that before the portrait went to the salon, Gautreau was pleased with it. She wrote a friend that Sargent had, quote, created a masterpiece of the portrait. Sargent himself had some doubts and sought reassurance from his teacher, Carolus Duran. Um, so just comparing it to, to two of Sargent's earlier works, again, I think draws out how unusual and um, interesting it is these deliberately elegant, flattering portraits on the left and the right, the way that the sitters gaze out at the viewer, they engage with us. Um, they're both posed, you know, quite specifically, but Gautreau's pose is much more kind of active, difficult, and stiff. Um, a very, very different tone for these two portraits. Sargent really, again, drew on art history, and once the painting came to the Salon, critics immediately compared it to various works of art. Um, of course, Antique Sculptures of Venus, this comes out of that same, those same criticisms of, or the comments about Gautreau as a living statue. Images of the goddess of the hunt, Diana, which was a very popular motif and symbol of beauty in the Third Republic. And of course, even Renaissance profile portraits uh, like the one you see on the screen. But I want to look also at contemporary images of Parisians by artists who were important to Sargent and known to him. And we're looking, of course, you see Manet on the left, Whistler in the middle, and Giron, who's probably not quite a household name, but another French artist who was a friend of Sargent's. And they are all tapping into ideas about what the Paris, chic Parisian woman was in this era. Both Whistler, I'm sorry, Manet on the left and Giron on the right are looking at a modern woman in day wear. She looks, she could be out strolling as Manet or like the Giron just come in or about to leave the house. Well, Whistler's portrait of Lady Mieux, which had been shown at the Salon of 1883, and Sargent certainly would have known, shows this socialite in this glamorous evening gown. And I feel certain that Sargent saw himself as tapping into this tradition in his portrait of Gautreau. So on the opening day of the Salon, May 1st, 1884, as many of you know, the portrait became a scandalous success. Even though Sargent had protected his sitter's identity, as was the tradition of the day, the title in the catalog was Madame Asterix, 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 everyone who saw the portrait knew exactly who it was and recognized Gautreau. Sargent's friend and a distant cousin, Ralph Curtis, who was also a painter, described the great fuss that surrounded the picture on the opening day at the Salon. He writes, there was a grand tapage before it all day, in a few minutes, I found him, Sargent, dodging behind doors to avoid friends who looked grave. By the corridors, he took me to see it. I was disappointed in the color. She looks decomposed. He's writing to his parents, by the way. All the women jeer. Ah, voila la belle. Oh, quelle horreur, etc., etc. Then a painter exclaims, ah, oh, superb style, magnificently daring. Oh, um, sorry, and so on and so on. So we know, as I said, that Gautreau had been complicit in all of these decisions, the choice of dress, which was one of her favorites. She and her mother were reportedly devastated by this initial response, I think understandably. Gautreau and her mother rushed the artist studio later that day in tears, and Ralph Curtis says, I held them off, but the mother returned later, and begged him to remove the portrait. She said, my daughter is lost, all Paris mocks her. She will be forced to flee, she will die of chagrin. Sargent defended the portrait and insisted that he had painted her just as she was dressed. And I wanted to note here too something I've been thinking about um, as this letter from Ralph Curtis has had taken on huge, tremendous importance in Sargent's scholarship and literature and has become really the baseline for the, the sitter and the mother's reaction about the portrait. But note again that 
he's saying the mother is the one who's com complaining. Um, we don't exactly know what Gautreau thought, and I don't, you know, she, maybe she did hate it, maybe she was distressed, but I want to just inject that doubt into you, and we'll talk about this more in a minute. Um, and of course, finally, we're getting to the well-known elephant in the corner. Um, Gautreau's dress, had, which was perceived as indecent by some, became a target of the criticism. The most distinctive feature, of course, according to his descriptions, was the bodice, described, quote, made up of only two fins, having no other attachment above the shoulders than a simple silver chain. And while the dress was repeatedly discussed in reviews, its designer has not been identified. Its style was bold, but not outside the realm of current fashion, and was probably more likely to be seen on an actor or a kind of performance than performer than a socialite. And in fact, oh shoot, I have them in the wrong order. Um, the best, the well-known feature, I just like see it buried my <laughs> lead a little bit. Of course, Sargent had originally painted her right shoulder strap sliding off her shoulder, which certainly kind of added to the scandal and the shock of seeing it. Um, let me just see something. Oh, I, I wanted to just say for a moment, here are two examples of portraits that were also shown at the Paris Salon in 1884, um, Chaplin on the left and Cabanel on the right. And if you look, I hope you can see, it's a little pale maybe. Um, look at her, how low cut her dress is and how this side is kind of sliding off her shoulder. And similarly in the Cabanel, low cut, sliding shoulder. Um, so this remarkable fuss, get that right, about her shoulder strap flying um, off her shoulder um, is something to talk about. Um, let me see, I just got my slides a little mixed, missed up, bear with me for a minute. Um, this, oh my goodness. Um, this motif of the, the strap sliding off the shoulder was seen as a not so subtle cry for attention, um, a brazen attempt to garner attention at the salon. In addition, many who saw the portrait found Sargent's depiction unflattering and eccentric. His focus on her lavender skin tone highlighted the artificiality of her appearance, and um, this profile gaze, in addition, made her appear haughty. Oh, yeah, that's my... I messed up all my good effects here. Um, of course, after the salon, Sargent took the portrait. He didn't, you know, he could not take it off the walls during the run of the exhibition. He brought it back to his studio and he repainted the shoulder strap almost immediately. And we know that because in this uh, photograph of Sargent in his studio with Madame X on the easel, easel, you see, and this is from about 1885, 84, the shoulder strap is already up. So this kind of great controversy around it, um, it's hard not to imagine that his repainting of the strap was a bit of a capitulation, but for him to pose with the portrait in his studio right after the scandal also tells us something. And, and Sargent, I think, remained proud of the portrait for the rest of his career and always kept it on view in his studio. Um, one of the most astute and I think important commentary about the painting came from a French critic, Louis de Fourcault, whose portrait by Sargent you see on the right. He recognized that Sargent's, the portrait had transcended portraiture and to create an iconic image of a new type in society, the professional beauty, whom he described as the Parisian women of foreign origin raised from her childhood to be an idol. He explained, know that in a person of this type, everything relates to the cult of the self and the increasing concern to captivate those around her. She ends up being more than a woman. She becomes a sort of canon of worldly beauty. Her sole purpose in life is to demonstrate her skills in contriving incredible outfits which shape her and exhibit her and which she can carry off with bravado and even a touch, touch of innocence, like Diana, goddess of the hunt, sporting her loose tunic. Her character of plastic idol, almost superhuman, soon despoils herself of the inconvenience of all her eccentricities. And this idea of this, uh, the idea of the professional beauty of, of foreign origin, I think is important here because it identified Gautreau as an outsider in Parisian society and questioned her status. Um, another writer, Ars Arsène Housset, editor of the journal Artiste, had 
mentioned that um, in 1866, sorry, 1867, that a woman could be Parisian by birth or by dress. American-born Gautreaux had achieved that status by dress. And that fashion was an essential part of her transformation from this American to a Parisian. And Sargent deftly captured this performance as a, pro as a professional beauty. And even though Sargent repainted the shoulder strap, I think this, the, the idea of the strap falling off her shoulder, this brazen attempt for attention, was really seen as a fashion faux pas and a symbol of this upstart American who was infiltrating French society. Um, I wanted to note um, an element that often goes unnoticed is this little crescent moon that you see on her head. This um, had become an important symbol of the goddess Diana, but was also associated with ideas of beauty and innocence and purity in the Third Republic. So you see examples of that, Diana on the left um, from the 18th century, and then a portrait from, the, um, from 1879 of, of Vanderbilt with this same motif. So, oh my gosh. Did you never, never switch around your slides right before your talk? Um, it's never a good idea. Um, I wanted to just spend one quick moment talking about her makeup and how important this was to Sargent's depiction of her. Um, to, to paint this artificial tone, skin tone that she was known for became a huge artistic challenge. And Sargent had already been praised for the vitality of his portraits, but then shows a subject who deliberately hid behind a lot of makeup. And she was famous for this artificiality. Cosmetics were seen as a mean for a woman to improve upon nature, but also a farm, form of artifice or trickery. And critics who saw the portrait at the Salon were alarmed by Gautreaux's deathly pallor. And Susan Sedlowskis, um, a scholar who's written about Madame X, argued how that, you know, this the diffuse violet of her skin tone um, was evidence of sickness or illness, and that's how many people saw it. And we remember that his friend, his cousin Curtis, described her appearance as decomposed. Um, we have an amazing description um, of, of her cosmetics by a painter, Ukrainian painter, Marie Bashkurtsev a woman of noble birth who studied painting in Paris. And she's really best known for the extensive journal she kept for most of her life. And they were published in 1887. In her diary, she recalled seeing the portrait on the opening day of the Salon. And she admired the portrait, was but brutal in her assessment of Gautreaux's makeup. And I think this is a, a really interesting description, if not a bit catty. Um, he says, she says, there's also a painting by Sargent of the beautiful Madame Gautreaux. For me, it is a perfect painting, masterly, true. He has reported what he saw. The beautiful lady is horrible in daylight because she uses too much makeup in spite of her 26 years. This chalky paint looks like plaster and gives her shoulders the hue of a corpse. Further, she paints her ears pink and her hair the color of mahogany. The eyebrows are traced in mahogany to form two heavy lines. She's crazy or blind. What I don't understand is the mother or the husband who lets her do it. But, she adds, at night she is very beautiful. All right. And I, I had to address another um, important detail. I know Gautreaux has been called a known adulterer. And, but we don't actually have evidence that she was an adulterer. Who was a known adulterer was Dr. Pozzi. And the relationship between the two um, has been much discussed, immortalized in the ballet, among other things. Many works of historical fiction have sensationalized their relationship, claiming they were lovers and going into quite a lot of detail. But there is also more, newer scholarship emerging that m shows that that may not have been the case. Um, but I just want to say, this is my opinion, that it, we, we just don't know. But I think that these stories seem so believable is testimony to the power, charisma, and sensuality of these portraits. And I'll leave you to decide, because you can see both of the show, the paintings in the exhibition. Oh gosh, I'm um, going on a bit, I'm gonna breeze through these next slides, because I just wanted to give you some idea when we talk about wall power, returning to this idea of what it was like to visit the salon 
and um, the kind of art that was seen there against Madame X. And so here is a map of the Salon of 1884. Madame X was in room 31. There were almost 2,500 paintings that year shown, and they were arranged alphabetically. <laughs> so you'll, you get a lot of what you get is what you get. So in 31, you have a lot of S's, a few other. It's a little bit of a game of Tetris. Um, here's a view of the main floor where the sculpture was, and you see the arcades around, and the rooms with paintings would have been beyond. We know um, that upwards of, we think upwards of 400,000 people attended the Salon. To just give you an idea of how popular it was, it was a place to see art, but it was also a social place to be seen um, and to see other people and admire um, society. So here are four examples of works that were in the S room at the Paris Salon with Madame Gautreaux. So by artists, I didn't even include the captions, they're artists I'm sure you've never heard of, um, works that have been forgotten today, a mix of genre scenes, kind of um, administrative, attractive but plain landscapes, and uh, this um, lovely genre scene of an invalid on the lower left. But when we talk about wall power, and I'm, lo I'm loading the deck because I actually don't know how big the other paintings were and the scale could be off, but think about how Sargent paints her and how she stands out among these works. And here are some other examples of kind of exotic orientalist scene scenes. Um, when we talk about her bare chest and nudity at the salon, I don't know why they were being so prudish, because there was tons of nudity. This painting by Bouguereau, the youth of Bacchus from that year, is 20 feet long. So that figure in the center, doing a kind of yoga backbend, was bigger than life size. And then um, perhaps my, one of my favorites, um, other examples, you see a painting by Jerome on the right, the slave market, and the kind of inexplicable work on the left by Bayard, an affair of honor, where I hope you can make out there are two topless women dueling over a love affair. This is a painting that, very forgotten by us today, was extremely popular and reproduced at the time. So again, the idea that somehow Gautreau was lascivious um, disappears and there are other things at play. If we look at a few of the caricatures of the portrait, um, you start to see some of the ways that it was being poked fun at. And this motif occurs several times, the idea that she is like a figure on a deck of playing cards. The caption on the right says, new model for the ace of hearts, for a deck of cards, and here the woman of spades. And I think in one sense, it's, it's literally just thinking of it, the flatness, the profileness, profile of a deck of cards. That's a French playing card from 1877. Um, some of my favorites, um, critiques and cartoons. Here's a whole page that has uh, from a journal that's basically devoted to nudity at the salon. And you see here, there is our Gautreau in a wonderful caricature, um, the caption of which reads roughly um, uh, Meli, her nickname. You're losing your dress. <laughs> it's obvious. And it says, oh, you know, leave me alone. It, you know, it doesn't matter. And it, you know, don't, don't look at me. Don't, don't be bothered by it. Um, and this, the way that her, I mean, you see the classic profile, but her head is even turned up. Like, I can't be bothered. And then another example, um, a dress that, that can't, that doesn't bother the people around it, um, even though it was the height of so much discussion. Um, so, as I'm closing up, I just want to say, um, talk about, oh, and I would just, um, kind of what happens next to these figures, right? The idea that's so popular is that it kind of ruined her life, it ruined his career. I'd also like to kind of shift that narrative a little bit. Um, what we do know is that during the run of the Salon, a newspaper reported that Madame Gautreau was out and about in the evening in a dress that sounds exactly like the one she's wearing a in the portrait, a low-cut black dress with diamond shoulder straps. So she may have been upset, but she also may have decided to embrace the dress and the portrait and was seen in public around town. She went away for the summer, came back, and was again out in society doing her usual things that very fall. Um, we see in 
Oh, I, I guess I, what I wanted to say here too was just that, you know, the idea that the shoulder strap had caused this scandal, um, that, that it was much more complicated than that. And I hope that some of the nuances of our conversation today, the critical response, the way Sargent painted her, who she was, how she fit into society, um, kind of paints a fuller picture of that. And I think in a way, you know, it's, it's sort of all of these nuances is more than any shoulder strap could actually bear. So what happens after the salon? Um, as I said, she's out about and about in society. Um, in this work from 1889 for the World's Fair in Paris, um, a panorama by the artist um, Charles Castellane was exhibited and it showed scenes of Parisian street life with notable Parisians in the picture. And you see right here, here is Madame Gautreau. So the controversy of her being American, not quite Parisian, by 1889 apparently she has embraced in this painting of all of Paris. We see her again in 1890, a few years later at a ball at the Elysee. Here is her, here she is, her profile distinctive and wearing still her little crescent moon. Um, we have a few other images of her and I wanted to just speak very quickly about this kind of fashionable identity that she cultivated. Um, she was had a style and she um, over and over again presented herself that way. This painting is probably from 1882, so even before Sargent's portrait, um, presumably based on this photograph by Nadar of around the same year. But already you see this idea of her profile is something that she exploited and obviously um, saw it as one of her best angles. And this is how she was represented over and over again. Here is a portrait of 1891 by Gustave Courtois. And I think you see that it's building exactly on the sergeant. She may be wearing a white dress that's very flowy, but the sharp profile, the shoulder strap sliding off, the plunging neckline. I don't think this is someone who is shirking away from the sergeant portrait. And then this one from 1898 by Antonio de la Gandara, again, exploiting the profile, this kind of elegant pose. And I should have said that the Courtois actually was purchased by the French government and entered their collection that very year. And we, when we see them all together, again, this idea that she cultivates an imagery um, and uses her fashion, her costume, her cosmetics, her hairstyles, and her profile as, as really her markers and her style. Um, and, and interestingly, we haven't found any photos of her after that one of 1882. So whether she didn't appear in photos and preferred to kind of work the paintings, we, we don't know. But of course, if you find one, please, please let us know. Um, and as for Sargent, I mean, well, I guess we know what happens to him because we've seen the magnificent exhibition. He becomes the greatest portraitist of his time in the United States and in Europe. And here he is in 1884, smoking a cigarette. Um, of course, he does have some trouble getting commissions after the portrait, and he does move to England. He had considered moving there even before the portrait of Madame X, but because of the hesitancy of patrons to sit for him, that kind of, I think, hastens his move. He uses the next few years to make incredibly interesting progressive paintings and portraits, uh, portraits of interesting figures, um, works again that probably were not done on commission. He finds these um, fascinating creatures, performers, and paints these incredibly evocative, performative portraits. And I would like to put Gautreau in that role as well, alongside of these, that he created portraits to further his reputation, dramatic, fascinating people. Two other works that you can see in the exhibition are the works that really established him in London as the great portraitist, Lady Agnew and Mrs. Hammersley. They're in different rooms in the show, but they were both shown at the Royal Academy in London in 1893 to great acclaim. He won an award at the Royal Academy, but again, he's using the age-old strategy where these portraits are quite in contrast to each other in the sense that Lady Agnew is very, I mean, she's sensuous, she's calm, she sort of sinks into that chair, very kind of staid and fixed. Well, Mrs. Hammersley, again, the wife of a banker, 
up and coming um, kind of bourgeois family is wearing a brilliant fuchsia shocking gown and about to leap off of that sofa and critics noticed immediately this dichotomy and patrons had a ch their choice of what kind of sergeant that they wanted. As for Madame X, he, as I said, keeps her in his studio for the rest of his life. And here you're seeing his London studio on Tite Street in the early 20th century. Um, so you're seeing you know, just like these almost continue each other, where here's Madame Gautreaux, interestingly behind a curtain, which could be opened and closed to be revealed for his patrons. And here's the other side of the wall. Um, and people who visited his studio would report catching a glimpse of the famous portrait, um, which was always so dear to him. Um, and then just the final note in this chapter, um, which is that Sargent didn't exhibit the painting publicly for many, many years, almost 20 years. In the early 20th century, Gautre Sargent, very, very famous at this point, Gautreaux reaches out to him and says, please, will you please exhibit my portrait again? And he says, you know, I don't want to, forget it. You know, I think he felt very um, abandoned by her, this port great work they had created together, and she, you know, denounced him and, and was very upset by its reception. Um, he refused to send it to the exhibition she wanted to, but he began, little by little, to show the portrait more and more. In 1915, he sent it to San Francisco for the Panama Pacific exhibition, and he then, at that point, I'm going to add this last story for Erica, because the story about how Madame X comes to the Met has to do with a Bostonian. Um, and that is Edward Robinson, who had been a curator here at the MFA, and then was the director of the MFA, and had become very friendly with Sargent when he was painting the murals at the MFA, I'm sorry, at the Boston Public Library and beyond. And Sargent writes, Robinson is in his role as the director of the Met and says, you know, the painting is here, I think, I want it to be in a museum, maybe the Met wants it. And Robinson writes the trustees immediately and says, I've been trying to get this painting from him for years, we should buy it immediately. So, um, unfortunately, he was working at the, for, for Boston, he was working at the Met at the time, I have no doubt if he had still been here, Madame Gautreau would be at the MFA. Um, the painting was celebrated, um, the headlines, masterpiece rejected by subject, now acquired by the museum. And I just wanted to note this, um, the, the, at the bottom, the face and form are unforgettable, and it seems that the woman's very soul is bared to the spectator. So we see at this moment the kind of legend and icon um, becoming more and more formed and entrenched. And I end with this last image of um, bookends to Sargent's career in Paris, um, his career in general, Madame X on his easel in his studio in Paris, and then several decades later in his studio in London um, with this image of Gautreaux in the middle, because this is a story about the timelessness of the portrait. It's a story about the transformation of Sargent's career and the transformation of Gautreaux into this icon. Um, thank you so much for your attention, and I'm, I'm happy. I have gone on longer than I intended, but I am happy to answer questions if anyone has them. Or maybe you're fully saturated, but I'm very, very grateful. Um, there's someone coming with a mic for you. If you can try, you can try. Uh, hold on one oh, second. No, she wants, she wants, oh, because I think, you know, we for, do the that for the audience online. online. live stream too, so. Hi. Just wondering, did Dr. Pozzi ask Sargent to paint his portrait, or was it the other way around? You know, well, I think we're not sure. It's, it could be uncommissioned. I think we're not entirely sure. The suspicion is it is not a commission, so that he sought him out again as this kind of fascinating creature. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one is, how old was uh, Madame Gaufret in this last picture? So I think that this photo was taken around the time she get, got married, so 19 or 20. And in the portrait, she's probably 25, 26. And then what, do you know what the difference was in evening lighting at that time? Were they using gaslight or candles that the makeup would have enhanced 
her appearance at night? Yeah, I, I think there must have been some of both, um, but probably a lot of candlelight at some of the evening things that she was doing um, compared to the kind of the sunlight of the studio. Although it sounds like she wore the makeup in day and night. Uh, thank you so much for your talk, it was excellent. My question is, how long was the salon held? How, you know? I, I think it's, a, I, you know what, I actually don't know. I wanna say, is it like six weeks? Or I'd have to double check that, I should yeah. know. Okay. Yeah, anyone right. in the audience know? No. Another question is, didn't she own the, um, the portrait, the painting when he did it? No, so the, the painting was not a commission. Oh. Um, so after it came off of the walls of the salon, Sargent took it back to his studio and then kept it for all those years. I see. So and I think that's why he started the second, the, re the replica of it, thinking that maybe she would buy it or he would be able to exhibit it in multiple places. But I no, see. he kept it. And what happened to the uh, painting after he died? Right. So he gave it to, he sold it to the Met in 1916, so he was still alive. Oh. So he, he, and he died in 1925, so, yeah. There's one over there. What, that what did the Met pay to acquire the painting? Um, I think it was a thousand pounds, which we have kind of roughly calculated in kind of current dollars would have been something like a hundred thousand dollars, but it's very hard to you know, to, to gauge it, um, what that would really be like. I, I know that Edward Robinson considered that a very favorable price at the time. At the height of his career, he would have been charging more for a commission portrait. So it was, it was deemed a good deal at the time. Um, what, can you tell us anything about the rest of her life? Did she ever have children? She did, she, yes, so she had one child who actually was in that image of the, um, that panorama I showed where she was in the corner, like she was holding her child's hand. Mm -hmm. I think the child doesn't live a full life. There's some mystery about what happened to her, kind of the nasty gossip columns say that she got fat and hid from society and would only appear at night and go for a swim at the beach and things like that. Mm -hmm. But we also have caricatures of her from sort of 1909 um, gambling at Monte Carlo so she's still out and about. I think she obviously was less prominent um, in society. We actually do know that she had some health issues and I think that's how she um, was friendly with Dr. Pozzi because he seems to have treated her as a patient. I don't know the exact nature of those illnesses, um, but it is a little, it's a little mysterious. And she stayed married and then how, how old was she when she died? She did stay married, um, but they did have an arrangement at a certain point, not too long after the portrait where they had separate households. Um, so what I don't know, we can read into that. I mean, her husband was twice her age. So that's something else to consider. Um, she dies around 19, I think she dies in 1915. So it's around the time that Sargent decides to sell the portrait, which makes sense. Um, so she was, um, gosh, not that old. She would have been sort of only 50 something, I think. I'd have to do the math. Because she was a little um, younger than Sargent. So 50 or 60, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I, um, I did mention for this portrait, um, it's unusual, the technique, right, that he made so many studies to kind of figure out how to pose her. And of course, Sargent's style and technique changes over the course of his career. So when we're talking about this early period in his career, 1884, 80, 83, when he paints this portrait, I think he's still somewhere um, kind of entrenched in his academic practice and the, the kind of preparatory studies and the ambition of kind of pouring his knowledge of art history and references into the portrait. Um, of course, as his career progresses, he becomes, I would say, much more painterly, exuberant and expressive and does fewer and fewer studies as he goes along. So um, in the exhibition, 
across the way, you can see like the early example of Madame X, which is very kind of tightly drawn, has sharp profiles, some expressive brushwork in the dress, but then look at later works, um, like what's a good example in the exhibition um, that just becomes much more painterly, um, uh, like the, the Marquess of Londonderry, right? Or some of those amazing swags of drapery that are like practically abstract in their brushwork and detail. That, that becomes a hallmark really more of his later style. And his earlier style is I think much more a little more academic. He's really still trying to kind of fit into the academic tradition and the, the kind of aesthetics of the salon. We are out of time for questions today, but thank you so much for joining us and thank you, Stephanie, for the wonderful Thank you, lecture. everyone.